Greetings. As one and I drove home from church last Sunday, my mind began to list all the things that I had wanted to say uh, but didn't because I felt that I did not have the time to develop them properly. The more I thought about it, the more frustrated I got, uh, but the quicker the answer to, or the solution to the problem uh, became clear to me. And that is you just write, create a new sermon because these points are really important. So my message this morning is entitled, Loose Ends Are Important. Last Sunday, we discussed knowing and doing God's will. And we were using uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, uh, as our specific reference. He wrote, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And our focus, of course, last week was more on the idea that every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ uh, have a specific task to accomplish for God. It's unique to each one of us uh, as individuals, just as Jesus had a special mission uh, when the Father sent him uh, to, from heaven uh, to earth. And if we are going to be, or, or are to be, like Jesus, that uh, is clearly established in Scripture, mind you, uh, then it stands the reason that if Jesus completed his mission that God had for him, that we are equally uh, obligated to complete the mission, the purpose, uh, that God would have for each one of us, whatever it is. So we looked last week at the four ways that we could uh, determine what it is that God has uh, for us to do. We said at first that we uh, were to pray and ask him, where am I to fit into uh, your purposes? Uh, how am I to minister in a way uh, that you would have me uh, minister? Secondly, that we were to know that the, the Holy Spirit has already given us a specific tool or gift uh, to be successful in doing whatever it is that God has for us to do. Now, Scripture teaches clearly that everyone, all Christ's followers, uh, have at least a gift and some may have one or two. There are no exceptions. And so having that gift given to you by the Holy Spirit is a huge clue as to what it is, what area of life God might have you uh, minister in. The third thing what we determined was that we should be listening to the prompting and the, uh, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us as he guides and directs us uh, in accomplishing what it is that God uh, would have for us, something that is of eternal uh, significance. And the fourth and final thing we said was that we are to move forward. Take one step at a time, because God uh, directs people who are in motion. Now, the thing that I thought about driving home last Sunday that I did not get to uh, elaborate on uh, was this whole issue of good works, that term that is used uh, in the passage in Ephesians, the good works that God has uh, prepared for us. Now, that phrase, good works, as Paul used it in Ephesians 2, verse 10, has a very specific meaning. Since Paul is identifying those works as having been prepared in advance by God for us. They are not determined by us. We don't determine them. God determines them. Well, that establishes two qualities. First, obviously, that the good works originate from God. He prepared them. Secondly, they are unique to us because he has gifted us through the Holy Spirit to accomplish those tasks, his purposes. God uses us to accomplish his will in us 
as we minister to others through our obedience to whatever his will for each of us is. Secondly, the requirement for those works to have eternal significance is that they are not only prepared for us by God, not us, but that they are done by us after we have become part of God's family, not as a means of becoming a member of his family. That only comes solely through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, good works that have eternal significance are the result of God's process of transformation, our change from inside out that God brings in our lives. Good works originate in the goodness of God, not in our goodness. Therefore, we must be a Christ follower before we do good works if we want them to have eternal uh, significance. The eternal significance comes from God's presence and his power in our lives. True goods, good works flow from our relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Both Paul and Jesus' half-brother James write that faith without works is a dead faith. So genuine faith in Jesus Christ must result in ministry to others, those good works. It's part of being like Jesus, and that is God's will for us. Do you remember the parable that we spoke of some time ago um, in Matthew chapter 25? It's the story that Jesus tells of uh, the master, a metaphor for himself, uh, who's going to go away uh, uh, for some significant time, but undefined, like uh, between his first and second coming. And so he calls three servants uh, together, and he gives the first man five talents or assets or resources. And he then gives the second man three talents uh, or assets. And then the third man got one talent. Now, the first man that got five talents, when the master came back in this story, uh, he returned 10 talents uh, to the master. The one who had six, he returned six. And yet we see in Jesus's parable that both men were given equal rewards because the size of their return was not the issue. The issue vis-a-vis -vis the master was their faithfulness and obedience in using what he had given them. The third servant took his resource, his talent as it were, and he buried it and he brought it back to the master when he returned. And the master cast him into outer darkness. A serious consequence for not using the talent and the resource that God gives us. You know, there's a lot of confusion in the uh, world of Christianity about good works. So many, many people get the cart before the horse in that they think that by doing good works, that indicates that they are okay with God, that they're part of his family. There's no mention or consideration of repentance from sin or faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for our sins. Our good works do not. This confusion led Jesus to teach in his famous Sermon on the Mount, which you find in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. But in chapter 7, as he's coming to the close of that famous sermon, in verses 21 through 23, Jesus speaks of the day that we will all stand before him and give an account for our lives. And he talks about these people who will come and list one good work after another, serious good works, 
that they said that they did in his name. He does not deny that they didn't they did the good works, but he says to them, I never knew you, depart from me. And then he calls them evil doers. Why? Because they did what they did in their own goodness, not his. Make sure that your good works flow from your relationship with God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in you as a result of your relationship with God so that those good works have eternal significance because they come with the power and are from the power and the presence of God in your life. The second thing that I wanted to elaborate on and didn't get a chance to is this whole issue of giftedness. We uh, looked at how the Holy Spirit gives every follower of Jesus a gift that enables us to be successful to do whatever it is that God has purposed for us to do. And we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Now, there's a parallel per, uh, passage we're not going to read today, uh, and we did not read last week, but Paul talks about this same topic in Romans chapter 12, and you're free uh, to look at that uh, because it tells us pretty much the same thing. But in Corinthians, Paul says this, there are different gifts, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Jesus is Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all believers. That's four through six. Verse seven says, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Well, last week I emphasized uh, that last phrase in uh, verse six because I wanted everyone uh, that heard me both uh, on YouTube and Facebook and in the sanctuary on Sunday morning to understand that every true believer was given a gift. There are no exceptions. They don't run out when you're in your 70s or 80s and we have people in our 90s. So I wanted them to understand that they had a gift and they were therefore responsible to use that gift just as Jesus had taught in that parable in Matthew 25. But in the whole of those verses, there are another couple of points I would like to make today that I didn't get a chance to make last week. First, how unique and different each gift is. And, you know, Paul says different gifts, different services, different workings, uh, different kinds of service. And that is because God honors and celebrates our uniqueness as individuals. He gives us a gift through his Holy Spirit that fits our temperament and our inclinations uh, and skills in, uh, in how we are as an, uh, an individual, a person, unique. And the second thing is that uh, they come at his sole discretion. God, the Holy Spirit, gives us gifts so that we can work in different settings, different situations. They all, doesn't matter how different they are, but they are all energized by his presence and his power in our lives. That's why they're said to have eternal significance. Anything that has eternal significance begins and ends with the presence and the power of God, not us. No, it's an interesting thing, just as a sidelight, that the eternal God of creation, the sovereign God of the universe, who can do anything he chooses to do, chooses to use people, humans, to accomplish his purposes. We are his representatives, and he's given us every opportunity to be successful at that. You notice that's how he, he blesses uh, others. Uh, you notice that verse 7, that these gifts are given for the common good. Now, the other aspect of giving, or uh, gifting, comes from the, Paul's letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. We read Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And in verse 11, Paul lists 
uh, gifts that Jesus gives to the church. These are gifts, unlike the gifts that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians and in Romans 12, these gifts are in the form of human beings, people. People who already have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in them, Jesus now gives to the church as a gift. Paul lists them as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. These people are given by Jesus to support the work of the church globally. If you look at verse 12, Paul says they are to prepare God's people for the work of of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, referring to the church. God's people do God's work. These folks that Paul is talking about as gifts from Jesus to the church, they are the ones who prepare the people, organize them, and lead them. But it is the people that do the work of the church. Here the distinction uh, with these gifts is as I said, they are human beings, they're people. They're given by Jesus uh, to his church so that it can be effective in accomplishing God's purpose for the church. But what I want you to see that what is common to both types of gifts, those in Ephesians uh, that Jesus gives and those in Romans and 1 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit gives, is the obedience that is, uh, brings effectiveness in accomplishing God's purpose and God's will. Paul says that the uh, obedience, the effectiveness, uh, comes through unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That word knowledge there is not the Greek term for knowledge. It is the Hebrew word. For knowledge, which speaks of knowledge from experience, i.e. relationship, friendship. It's not knowledge about, it's knowing a person, God the Holy Spirit. The unity, a unity of, the, of the faith is uh, the teaching of uh, the Christian faith. Relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual process. Uh, it only comes through the power and the presence of, uh, of God. It's not a human religion. It's not of human intent. It's eternal significance again. Notice that last phrase in verse 16 of that passage in Ephesians. Each part must do their work. That refers to the fact that everyone has a job to do. No one is expendable. No one uh, is too small and too insignificant to be part of God's plan. The goal is obedience so that we can and do God's will. Now, the third part uh, that I wanted to speak to you about uh, was the fact that I mentioned that Satan loves to tell lies uh, to believers, to distract them misdirect them, uh, to discourage them. Oh, you're too old. Oh, you, you're physically uh, you know, weak. You, don't, you can't do anything. There's nothing you can contribute. So why even try? Well, here's a couple of things I want you to bear in mind. First, the Bible teaches us very clearly that Satan is the father of lies. That's his only tool, quite frankly, is that he can lie and deceive and misdirect uh, believers. You see, the misdirection here is that the issue is not what we have to contribute. Even with our giftedness, the issue is our obedience and our willingness to be faithful to do what God would have us do. The impact, the results, or the consequences come from God's supernatural power and his working his own purposes through limited human beings like you and me. Not our giftedness, as good as or as important as that is, or our skills. Now, our gifts are important. 
I don't mean to demean them. They come from God himself. But just think, even if we were superbly gifted beyond all measure, they don't have any, those gifts don't have any spiritual or eternal significance without God's presence and his power. Even the smallest gesture, flipping the coin 180 degrees the other way, even the smallest gesture empowered uh, by God the Holy Spirit can, through his presence, change an individual's life for eternity. Nothing is too small in God's hands. A simple smile, a word of encouragement. You know, even if you are, are, are homebound, as many are now because of the virus, maybe you can't drive or you're not supposed to be out of the house, you can still employ one of the most powerful tools that any believer has, and that's prayer. When God prompts you to do something that appears small in significance, if God is in it, the issue is your obedience and your faithfulness to do it. Let God worry about the impact. You just be faithful and obedient. Do God's will consistently. You will be amazed at the result. Let's pray. Father God, we are just so blessed that you take fallen, broken people uh, like us, and through your presence in our lives, the giftedness that you give us, you accomplish your purposes here on earth. I pray, Father, that each of us will learn that, believe that, trust in that, and, uh, and are faithful and obedient to do your will. Thank you, Father, for all your gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings.